You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash kalaminstitute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the previous uh, couple of sessions, we've been talking about the beginning of revelation and what that experience was like for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and what was the exact you know details of that entire experience. And then we talked about the immediate aftermath of that you know profound experience of the beginning of revelation. We then also addressed and we talked about the time shortly thereafter, and the very significant event of Fatratul Wahi, that was the subject that we talked about last week, the break or the pause in Revelation. And how, and at the end of the previous session, we talked about when Revelation continued, when it started back up again, and the narrations, the ahadith, which talk about the Revelation restarting, we talked about that entire incident where the Prophet ﷺ is walking, through the, through the marketplace, or he's walking outside uh, of Mecca, and he sees Jibreel alayhi salam in his true actual physical form again, the second time. And he was sitting down on a chair between the heavens and between the earth and the sky. And how overwhelming that was for the Prophet sallallahu and he sat down. And when he went back home, he received the revelation of, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'anthir wa rabbaka fakabbir, wa thiyabaka fatahir wa rujisa fahjur. And so the revelation began again, and the mission of the Prophet ﷺ was basically given to him, and that was to go out there to warn, and to proclaim the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to start preaching and teaching the message. Now before we actually talk about the da'wah, we talk about the actual execution of the mission and the message, and the preaching of that message, before we talk about that, the end of that revelation says that after that point on, فَتَتَابَ الْوَحْيُ فَتَتَابَ الْوَحْيُ Meaning that then from there on out, revelation consistently followed. That from that point on, revelation was normal, it was consistent, it was regular. So what I thought would be of benefit, and the classical historians, the classical scholars of the seerah, of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, what they do is they take this opportunity to discuss in a little bit more detail the na- exact nature of wahi. And even the Prophet ﷺ becoming comfortable in acquainting himself with this process of receiving revelation. I've alluded to a few things in the past. We talked about how before revelation actually started, there was a ru'ya as There were the true dreams that the Prophet ﷺ was receiving and that was something that occurred with all the Prophets so as to prepare their hearts and to prepare them emotionally emotionally to start grasping this reality of revelation. <coughs> and in one of the sessions, I talked about some of the different forms in which revelation would come to the Prophet ﷺ. But I thought it was worth discussing that in a little bit more detail. The first thing I'd like to talk about here is Hifzul Wahi, Siyanatul Wahi, which basically means the protection of revelation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has... He, he opened these doors of limitless treasures. I mean, when we talk about the Qur'an, we talk about the Book of Allah, we often talk about how it is a limitless treasure. And it is an endless gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never ending. Its blessings, its wisdoms are never ending. It's an ocean without an end. And that's the Qur'an. Well, that was exactly that divine revelation that the Prophet ﷺ was receiving. So, Whenever you have something, you have a treasure, you have anything of any significance, it warrants protecting. It requires protection. It's only, it's common sense. More than anything else, it's common sense to protect such a valuable asset and such a huge treasure. So similarly, divine revelation had to be protected. Now, what did it need protecting from? What, what, what were some possible maybe dangers? So when you have money, you worry about thieves or crooks. What, what would you worry about in terms of revelation? Well, the, the primary concern were the shayateen. The shayateen, and of course there's two categories, categories shayateen al-insi wal-jinn, the Qur'an tells us. There are evil people and then there are the evil jinn. I'm specifically referring here to the evil jinn. 
So jinn in and of itself is a creation of Allah. A lot of times even the word jinn has a very negative connotation in our minds. But the Qur'an, as we'll talk about it in a little bit, tells us when, that the jinn themselves, when they met the Prophet ﷺ, and they introduced themselves to the Prophet ﷺ, and they interacted with the Prophet ﷺ, they told in surah number 72, I believe, in surah number 72, when they, when they interacted and they conversed with the Prophet ﷺ, they actually told him, وَأَنَّا مِنَّ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّا دُونَ ذَلِكَ وَأَنَّا مِنَّ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّا دُونَ ذَلِكَ That there are, there are very righteous, pious people amongst us, and then there are some who are less than that. So the jinn in and of itself are an entity or a creation of Allah that are very similar to the human beings in the, in, in the sense of there are believers and disbelievers, there are good and there are bad. So even though we a lot of times just the direct association is of that being something frightening or something evil or something scary, that's not necessarily the case. But there are evil troublemaking jinns, just like there are evil troublemaking human beings. And those are typically referred to as shayateen. They are the army of the shaytan, iblis. And so the shayateen of the jinn, shayateen al-jinn, they had a very, the, the way that the shayateen al-ins and the shayateen al-jinn, used to work together. And they in fact, to a certain extent, continue to work together in a similar fashion. Is that the shay- especially, but this is something that was put an end to. The shayateen al-jinn would basically eavesdrop. For lack of a better word, they would eavesdrop on the discourse of the malaika and the angels. So when the malaika and the angels would be carrying the qadr of people, they would be carrying the rizq of people, they would be carrying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to execute on the earth amongst humanity. The shayateen al-jinn would basically eavesdrop on this. And of course we understand that nothing in this cone, nothing in this entire creation of Allah happens without the permission, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was of course something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed. Now you could ask, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow such a thing? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow shaitan to run around and distract us? لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Right? He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him license, to give him permission till the day of judgment. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, it, gave that license to him, gave him that permission that fine, you have till the last hour, you have till the final times to go around. And he even made his intention very clear that why am I amdidni ila yawmi yuba'athun, that allow me to continue on till the day that they will be resurrected. And he made his intention clear to Allah why he was asking for that license. Why? لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Because I would like to lead the majority of them astray. I would like to try to lead them astray. I'd like to deviate them from the path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed that to happen as a test for humanity. As a test and as a trial for humanity. You know, nothing comes easy. Nothing good, nothing worthwhile comes easy. بِقَدْرِ الْكَدِّ تُكْتَسَبُ الْمَعَانِي الْأُجُورُ بِقَدْرِ الْجُهُودِ So we have many different expressions and many different usul which state the same fact that according to the test and according to the trials, according to the difficulty, a person is able to overcome and endure in the pursuit of good, according to that will be the reward of a person. So one of the tests that used to be for the people of the previous umam, the, especially in between that time, between the uh, prophethood of Isa alayhi salam and the nubu of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam is that one of the tests for the people during that time was shayateen were given this ability by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were allowed to be able to eavesdrop on some of the discourses of the malaika and the angels and what they would do so if an angel had a command to maybe provide to, to allow or, or to facilitate you know, a certain amount of sustenance, a certain amount of risk, or a death, or a birth, or something like that, like an angel was being given a command, or an angel knew of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is to be executed amongst the people, then the shayateen would be able to eavesdrop, they would bring this information down, they would pass it along to the kuhan. They would pass it along to the kuhan, the kahina, which basically were the soothsayers, the fortune tellers, the sorcerers, the magicians, people of this ilk. And they would pass this information on to these people. Then when these people would pass that information on to other people who would come to them to have their fortune read and their fortune told, etc., etc., then at that point in time, of course, they, they, they were very persuasive. Because they would say, okay, this and this and this is going to happen. And when something even similar to that would happen, a person was basically convinced. But the test was that don't fall into that. That's an obvious trick of the shayateen. And it's a test for you. So don't fall into that. Much like the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah which talk about magic, that that was by the command of Allah that that magic was being taught. 
But it was a test for the people that don't go and listen to them, don't go and follow them, don't fall into this trap. So now when divine revelation is beginning, the Qur'an, the book of Allah, the kalam of Allah, the speech of Allah, the most amazing, precious treasure that has ever been offered to humanity. The greatest miracle of Allah that humanity is, uh, is not only going to witness but interact with. That's something else we don't realize, that the Qur'an wasn't just a gift, wasn't just a treasure, wasn't just a miracle from Allah that people witnessed, but it was one that people could and can continue to interact with. So it's a very, very valuable thing. And when this gift was coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah arranged for the protection of it. And that was basically by repelling the shayateen. And there are narrations, and we know about this, we, we've talked about this a little bit previously as well, that at some level this also started to happen at the time of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, but the process was basically completed. The doors were completely sealed shut. All the foolproofs, all the safeties were put into place at this point in time. So the final level of security was arranged for at the time of the beginning of Revelation. And so then at the, from that point on, there were the malaika, the angels. You know, the Qur'an talks about النَّجْمُ الثَّاقِبْ رُجُومَ shayateen. It talks about stars being shot at, being hurled at, like fireballs being hurled at the shayateen. That would literally cause them to burn and disintegrate. And to let them know that this was no longer going to be tolerated or allowed at any level. But there are more detailed narrations which tell us about a little bit more of an interaction. There's a narration that is mentioned both in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumullah. From Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he says, "Intalaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ashabuhu amidina ila suqi ukab." That the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions they went to the marketplaces at the place of ukab, which was right outside of the Haram area, which you know you can actually still visit till, there till today. And there was a very famous marketplace that would be set up there. It was like the mall, the mall of Uqqad. So the Prophet saw some of his companions. So this is of course obviously later on in the seerah, but this warns, warrants mentioning right now because of this is involved in the protection of revelation. And there had been an official security a layer of security that had been put down in between the shayateen and the khabar of the sama, the news of the heavens. Wa ursilat alayhim shuhub, and these fireballs had been sent their way. They were being burned. They were being disintegrated. And they were being warded off. Farajat shayateenu ila qomihim. So the shayateen came back to the other shayateen, or to even in this matter, in this in this case, you could even say they came back to the people that they would communicate with. Fakalu malakum. He said, "What's wrong with you? Why don't you bring us more news?" Qalu hila bainana wa bain khabri sama, that we've been cut off from the news of the heavens. وَأُرْسِلَتْ عَلَيْنَا شُهُبْ And these fireballs are being thrown at us. فَقَالُوا مَا ذَاكَ إِلَّا مِنْ شَيْءٍ حدث. And when the narration says that actually Iblis, they came back to report to their boss, to the head honcho Iblis. And he said, he responded to them, he said, مَا ذَاكَ إِلَّا, شيء إلا مِنْ شَيْءٍ حدث. That this is only happening because of some significant event that has occurred. Something has transpired, something has happened, because of which you can know, we can no longer go and listen to what the people in the heavens are talking about. فَضْرِبُوا مَشَارِقَ الْأَرْضِ وَمَغَارِبَهَا So go around searching throughout the earth, from all the way from the east to the west, and try to find out what has happened, what has changed, what has transpired. فَمَرَّ النَّفَرُ الَّذِينَ أَخَذُوا نَحْوَ تِهَامَ وَهُوَ بِنَخْلَةَ عَامِدِينَ إِلَى سُوقِ عُكَاظ So a group of them basically went in the direction of Tahama and the Prophet of Allah وسلم, along with his group was basically going towards the market of Ukav, وَهُوَ يُصَلِّ بِأَصْحَابِهِ صَلَاةَ الْفَجْرِ And the Prophet ﷺ stopped with his companions to pray at the dawn, uh, pray in the morning time. فَلَمَّا سَمِعُوا الْقُرْآنِ اسْتَمَعُوا لَهُ and then when they heard the Qur'an being recited by the Prophet ﷺ in the prayer, they stopped and listened to it very carefully. فَقَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي حَالَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ خَبْرِ السَّمَاءِ They said, this is what has come between us and the news of the heavens. There's another narration that actually says that it was earlier. This conversation transpired earlier that where they came to Iblis. And Iblis said, okay, go and look for maybe what's going on. And they said, they went out and they searched and they came back and they said, we can't find anything. 
No, in fact, one of the narration says that he sent them to Jerusalem. He sent them to Bilad Sham. He sent them to these areas where prophets would live. Historically, where the majority of the prophets were from. And they went there and they searched and they came back and they said nothing's really changed. So then Iblis came to the area of Mecca to look around and to search in the area of Mecca. And it says that he literally saw the Prophet ﷺ coming down from the cave of Hira after receiving divine revelation. And he saw Jibreel ﷺ leaving the cave of Hira. And that's when he realized exactly what had happened. But nevertheless, this narration says that they listened to the Qur'an and they said this is what's happened. فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ So they went back to their people. فَقَالُوا يَا قَوْمَ so they went back to the rest of the jinn and they said, Inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaban. We've heard a very remarkable, a mind blowing, and amazing Qur'an. Yahdi ila rushdi fa amanna bihi. That it, it guides us to that which is correct, that which is good. Fa amanna bihi. So we've believed in it. As far as we're concerned, we are fully convinced. Walan nushirika bi rabbina ahadan. And we will never ever associate anyone with our Lord ever again after today. فَأَوْحَ اللَّهُ إِلَىٰ نَبِيِّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ قُلْ Say, أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ That it was, it was sent down to me, I was informed, أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ That a group from amongst the jinn, they very carefully, attentively, they listened. And what did they listen to? They listened to the Qur'an. فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا And they said that we have heard a remarkable, amazing Qur'an. So this was the protection of revelation that was arranged by, divinely arranged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the revelation so that there would never be any confusion, there would never be any doubt in regards to the revelation. And there are other narrations similar to this that I mentioned before um, about... Iblis himself seeing the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and seeing Jibreel Alayhi Salaam and then realizing exactly what had transpired and what had happened. So now that we understand how revelation was protected, to talk a little bit more about how revelation would come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at what times, at what occasion, in what situations, and what was the effect of on, on, it, on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I've compiled here a bunch of different narrations. Now these are not necessarily from that point of the seerah which we are at, the beginning of the prophethood. These are from all throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ, but it's a survey. It's a survey of the different experiences of different occasions of what different people noticed, different sahaba radiallahu anhum, may Allah be pleased with them, what they observed about the Prophet ﷺ receiving divine revelation. In the hadith of Ifq, in the hadith of Ifq, which is the hadith about the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha, which is actually one of the most lengthiest hadith which is found in the compilation of the Sihah. Amongst the Sahih compilations, this is one of the lengthiest narrations, which is the hadith of Ifq, the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha, in that narration, she actually says, مَا رَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مَجْلِسَهُ وَلَا خَرَجَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ حَتَّى أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ to talk about the frequency of revelation. How frequent was revelation? She says that never did the Prophet ﷺ ever leave a sitting. Nor did anyone from the family of the Prophet ﷺ ever leave the house. Except that the Prophet ﷺ would receive revelation. Meaning, whenever the Prophet ﷺ sat down somewhere, like he sat down for a decent amount of time, he would receive revelation that sitting. Whenever somebody would come and go, meaning again, he was in the house, he was in the home, when people would come and go, as people were coming and going, revelation would be coming down. So she mean, what she means by this as an expression, if you will, is that the revelation was very, very frequent, and it was very common. And that the Prophet ﷺ was frequently receiving revelation. فَأَخَذَهُ مَا كَانَ يَأْخُذُهُ مِنَ الْبُرْحَى and then she says that the Prophet ﷺ would be gripped by the difficulty and by the weight, by the pressure. Pressure is a good word. He would be gripped, he would be, he would be overwhelmed by the pressure that he would receive from revelation. حَتَّى إِنَّهُ كَانَ يَتَحَدَّرُ مِنْهُ مِثْلُ الْجُمَانِ مِنَ الْعَرَقِ so much so that the Prophet ﷺ would oftentimes break out into a sweat. I've mentioned a narration earlier that talks about Aisha radiallahu anha that she saw the Prophet ﷺ sweating when receiving divine revelation even on the coldest of days. In, 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 to, to understand what that means is, the, you know, they, they lived in the desert. And in that night, it gets very, very cold in the desert. In fact, the closest you know, comparison, in fact, if somebody goes for Hajj or Umrah, you'll experience exactly what I'm talking about. 
where it doesn't matter what season the Umrah or Hajj you go in, at nighttime it starts to get a little chilly. I actually last weekend was in Phoenix, Arizona, which is, you know, uh, it, it's a desert region as well. During the daytime, it was 108 degrees. It was brutal. At nighttime, it dropped down to below 60 degrees. It was like 55 degrees and I literally half the temperature. To the point where it caught you off guard and because you got used to a higher temperature, it actually feels very cold. You feel like putting a sweater on. Now even in weather like that, in the middle of the desert where it gets very chilly at night, and they didn't have insulation in homes and heaters like we do. Even at that time she says the Prophet ﷺ will break out into a sweat. And so she says that, كَانَ يَتَحَدَّرُ مِنْهُ مِثْلُ الْجُمَانِ مِنَ الْعَرَبِ It's very eloquent actually the way she says it. يَتَحَدَّرُ مِنَ الْجُمَانِ Basically means pearls dropping. You know like if you have almost like a musabbaha, if you have like musabbaha, you have a tasbih, you have a dhikr, you have dhikr beads, and if you break them, you know how they, the, the little beads, they all kind of fall and they all scatter? So that's, that's the expression that means for like beads to scatter, except the word that is being used is juman, pearls. So imagine a necklace breaking and pearls are just falling and scattering off the string. She says that literally, يَتَحَدَّرُوا مِنْهُ مِثْلُ الْجُمَان مِنَ الْعَرَقِ That sweat would beat up on his forehead and would start to drip down from his face as if pearls had been released from their string. And what she means by this is not only to express how the sweat would fall from him, but she's also complimenting the beauty and the handsomeness of the Prophet ﷺ and the nur of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. That when he sweat, it didn't look like, you know, when I sweat, it's actually quite disgusting. You would not want to sit next to me. When the Prophet of Allah ﷺ would sweat, it looked like pearls were falling from his face. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَهُوَ فِي يَوْمٍ شَاتٍ And she says even though it was a very very cold day, مِنْ ثِقْلِ الْوَحِي الَّذِي يَنْزِلُ عَلَيْهِ Because of how heavy the revelation was. And this was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually warned him about. إِنَّا سَنُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا That we will continue to send down upon you a very very extremely heavy word. So the, she talks about the, the frequency of revelation was that frequent. Wherever he sat down, whenever somebody came and went, Revelation would come. But think about this, the frequency of revelation becomes that much more you know, thought-provoking when you realize it was so heavy on the Prophet ﷺ that after 23 years of experiencing divine revelation, it was so, still so heavy on him that on the coldest of days, on the chilliest of days, sweat would literally drip and pour from his face. That that's how heavy divine revelation was. You know, I, I, I meant to talk about this later, but I want you to—I want everyone to be cognizant and conscious of this as we read through these revelations. You know, we, we talk about appreciating the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's part of our part of the purpose of these series. But one other level of appreciating the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is yes, the Quran is a wonderful, beautiful gift, and receiving divine revelation, communicating with Allah, is a, a an unbelievable experience. But also think about the weight, the burden, and the difficulty that the Prophet ﷺ endured for 23 years of receiving the extremely heavy words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a, and it's almost as if the Prophet ﷺ was the filter. The Prophet ﷺ was the filter between us and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what ended up reaching us? The wisdom, the beauty, the sweetness. That's what reached us. And the weight, and the heaviness, and the burden, the Prophet ﷺ was the filter that caught all of that. And it really gives you a, an unbelievable appreciation for who the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was. And what he was willing to endure, and what he took, and what he tolerated, and what he carried, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of the ummah. It makes you understand and realize his love, his compassion upon humanity. His heart bled. His heart bled for people, for humanity. And he was willing to take so much so that, again, I jump forward in the seerah when we kind of get caught up in a topic like this. But even when we eventually, much, much later on down the road, when we reach the point where we talk about the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, when he exper experienced sakarat, sakarat al maut when he experienced the pangs of death, which is a natural part because the ruh is separating from the body. And it's something that isn't a sign of punishment. It's not a sign of a person being, in, being, being evil. But it's something that naturally is experienced. It's, it's almost like childbirth. When a woman experiences childbirth, it's not that because she's sinful, that's why she actually felt the giving birth to the child. That's something that's natural. So the Prophet of Allah ﷺ is experiencing sakarat because the ruh is pulling apart from the body. 
and he's getting ready to depart. And when the Prophet ﷺ felt this, he actually inquired to Jibreel ﷺ, that does everyone feel this? Is this standard? And, the, and he, was, he was informed that yes, this is standard, everyone will feel this. The Prophet ﷺ even tried to take that. He said, give, give me all of it, give me everything you got. Give me everything you got. But spare my ummah of this pain. Don't let them feel this. That was the compassion of the Messenger Sallallahu So, going on and talking about the receiving of divine revelation, <coughs> Imam Ahmad rahimahullah in his Musnad, he mentions a narration where a tabi'i, he says, Sami'atu Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu yaqul, I heard Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu saying, Kana idha nazala ala Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-wahyu, yusma' inda wajhihi kadawiyy al-nahli. That when revelation would be sent down upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you could hear near, you could near his face, close to his face, you could hear the sound of bees buzzing. Close to his face, you could see, hear a sound kind of like, the closest he said equivalent I can think of is like bees that are buzzing around his face. I Meaning there was something going on. And that, that, these types of narrations are very key and very important because Orientalists or people who would choose to speak ill of the Messenger wasallam and try to ridicule and mock Islam, they would try to prescribe this either to just the Prophet ﷺ, I have difficulty even saying it because it's so offensive. But they try to claim or they would try to say that these experiences were a sign of you know, um, psychological or mental instability on the part of the Messenger ﷺ. But what makes it very, very, these types of narrations are very key because even the people around him could feel, could sense, could hear something was going on. And we'll talk about some of these narrations. I've made an effort to compile these types of narrations. So he says we could hear a sound that was like the buzzing of the bees. And, and he mentions this in a narration which talks about the, the revelation of the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun. Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Surah number 23. In that narration, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu talks about this. And he says, when these ayat were coming down, I was sitting right next to the Prophet And it's as if I could hear bees that were buzzing around his face. In Sahih Muslim, there's a narration from Ubadah bin Samid radiallahu anhu that says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِذَا نَزَلَ عَلَى عَلَيْهِ الْوَحْيُ كَرَبَهُ ذَلِكَ وَتَرَبَّدَ وَجْهُهُ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ وَغَمَّضَ عَيْنَيْهِ وَكُنَّا نَعْرِفُ ذَلِكَ مِنْهُ That he says that when revelation would come down upon the Prophet ﷺ, it was very difficult on him. And his face would literally like, his face would change color, his face would get very very red because of the pressure that he was feeling. In again the Sahihain, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, it mentions a hadith of Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. He says, "Hina nazarat la yastaw al qa'idun min al mu'minin." The hadith, uh, the, the excuse me, the hadith of Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, which says that when the ayat la yastaw al qa'idun min al mu'minin. The ayat, ayah number 95 from Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4. When this was sent down, when this was revealed, فَلَمَّا شَكَا إِبْنُ أُمِّ مَكْتُومٍ ضَرَارَتَهُ نَزَلَتْ غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَا يَسْتَوِ الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the people who sit from amongst the believers, meaning the, pe believe, the people who don't go out, with the Prophet ﷺ on the campaign, in the path of Allah, with the Prophet ﷺ, but the ones who sit and stay back, they will never be equal to those who go out. They will never be equal in status and reward with those who go out. Abdullah bin Ummi Maktoum radiallahu anhu, who was a blind Sahabi, who was a blind Sahabi, who was one of the Mu'addins of the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, he actually came and he was crying. He was, he was devastated and he came to the Prophet ﷺ crying that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I can't go, not because I don't want to go, I would love to go, but because I am a burden upon people, I'm blind, they would have to take care of me the entire time in the journey, I would be a liability, so you tell me to stay behind. You've commanded me to remain behind. 
And that's why I can't go. And now I read that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will never be equal to my brothers. I can never gain the reward of my brothers by going out in the path of Allah with you, accompanying you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the next part of the ayah, غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرَ Except for those people who have some legitimate excuse, who have some legitimate difficulty. That when this ayah, when this verse was revealed, he says, وَكَانَتْ فَخِذُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَلَى فَخِذِي You know, if you've ever sat in a very tight space, if you ever sit in a very tight space, like you come for Salatul Jumu'ah or Salatul Eid or something, and you sit in a very tight space, and you have to sit squished all together, that sometimes if you're sitting like Indian style, right, you're sitting with your legs crossed, a lot of times what happens is that maybe your leg is a little bit on top of another person's leg. You know, your knee is crossing over onto the top of somebody else's knee. Because you're sitting so tight, squished together. So he says, we were sitting very tight, squished together like that when these ayat were being revealed. And he says that the knee of the Prophet the leg of the Prophet was on top of my leg. Meaning his knee was crossing over onto the top of my knee. And these ayat started to be revealed on the Prophet ﷺ. He says, وَأَنَا أَكْتُبُ And I was sitting beside the Prophet ﷺ and as these ayat were being revealed, he was telling me, alright, get ready, start writing. Zayd ibn Thabit was min kutab al-wahi. He was from the scribes of revelation. He was one of the people entrusted and depended on, upon by the Prophet ﷺ to write down the revelation. So he said that the Prophet ﷺ told me, he goes, okay, get ready to write. You have to write down the revelation. So he says, I was, I was gonna start writing, so that's why I couldn't even move. It was a very, you know, I, I was... I had a responsibility. فَلَمَّا نَزَلَ الْوَحْيُ كَادَتْ فَخِذُهُ تَرُدُّ فَخِذِي He says that when revelation started to come down, I felt like his leg was going to crush my leg. Like crush meaning like just, just break my leg. Like such immense pressure. Like something way too heavy for you has been put down on your leg and you really feel like it's going to break your leg. And he says, I literally felt like that. I felt that way, that my leg was going to break under the pressure that I was feeling. Yet again in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, there's a narration from Ya'la bin Umayyah, and he says that, قَالَ لِي عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He says, Umar رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ told me, he asked me, so Ya'la bin Umayyah is a Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ, and he says that Umar رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ asked me, he had just accepted Islam, and he was new to Islam, so he asked me, أَيَسُرُّكَ أَن تَنْظُرَ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ وَهُوَ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ would you like to see the Prophet our divine revelation is coming down on him? Like just imagine that experience of being able to witness that. So he says, would you like to see that? So he says, of course, I would love to see that. So he says, the Prophet was sitting amongst us, and, but what the Prophet had done is he had taken a cloth, he had taken some, some of his clothing, and he had draped it over his head. He had draped it over his head and he had his head lowered down. He had his head lowered down. Like, like, like somebody who was maybe trying to just, you know, kind of keep a low profile, keep to himself. He had lowered his head down and he had draped a cloth over his head. So he says, فَرَفَعَ طَرَفَ الثَّوْبَ عَنْ وَجْهِهِ So Umar رضي الله عنه lifted up the cloth on one side of the face of the Prophet ﷺ. Alright, that goes to show you a couple of things. First of all, it tells you about Umar radiallahu anhu was a very interesting person. Alright, that he would actually do that. That he, 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 he actually had the, the courage to actually do that. Secondly though, in reality what the scholars actually note about this is, this is the type of down-to-earth common person the Prophet ﷺ was. He's Rasulullah, Khatimul Anbiya, Sayyidul Mursaleen, Sayyidul Wuldi Adama Yawm Al Qiyamah, Sayyidul Awalina Wal Akhirin. I mean, the, 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 the list goes on and on and on. His credentials are never ending, his qualifications are never ending. That's who he was. He was the Messenger of Allah, Habibu Rabbil Alameen. But that, and when the Prophet says in the narration, and Sayyidul Wuldi Adama Yawm Al Qiyamah Wal Afakhra, that I am the leader of all of humanity, all of the children of Adam on the Day of Judgment, wala fakhra. And there's no arrogance involved for me in regards to this. I mean, I, I'm not arrogant because of that. There's no arrogance. He really meant it. The Prophet was such a, such a common man, like such a man of the people. He was so down to earth that the Sahaba actually felt that comfortable with him. Don't get me wrong, they had the utmost respect for him. They cherished every moment with him. And they did have limitations and boundaries with him. But you know what? 
There's actually evidence of this in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ was was sometime the Prophet ﷺ was so down to earth that sometimes the Sahaba radiallahu anhu would cross that line with the Prophet ﷺ. And they would have to be reminded about that line by Allah. The Prophet ﷺ wouldn't even remind them of that line himself. That it tells you a lot about the Prophet ﷺ. We can learn a lot about leadership from the Prophet ﷺ. Today unfortunately a lot of times leadership, in whatever capacity, not just politically or socially, but even Islamically and religiously, leadership unfortunately can be abused. A position or a sense of leadership can be taken as a license for being superior to everyone else. To not being, you know, to being in a position of where you're not, you know, you don't want to be troubled by other people. You feel like you have that license now where you shouldn't be disturbed or troubled by others. But when we look back at the Prophet ﷺ, we see the complete opposite attitude. No one was a greater leader than Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. Nobody was more important than the Prophet ﷺ. And nobody, nobody has ever been or will ever be busier than the Prophet ﷺ. And have more on his plate than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a. All of humanity was his responsibility. But in spite of that, the Prophet ﷺ was so accessible. And he was so down to earth. That the Sahaba radiallahu anhu felt this level of comfort with him. Where he lifts up the, 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 the cloth from his face. And I was talking about how sometimes they would even, not to, not to say that the Sahaba were disrespectful, but in, that, in that, that bond that they felt with him, in that relationship that they had with him, they would sometimes behave in a way with the Prophet ﷺ, not disrespectfully, but they would sometimes, you know, be so upfront or so casual with the Prophet ﷺ that Allah would have to remind them of the boundaries. لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعضا Don't call out to the Messenger like call out to each other. That they were told, لا ترفعوا أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. Don't raise your voices above the voice of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. That they were told, إن الذين ينادونك من وراء الحجرات أكثرهم لا يعقلون ولو أنهم صبروا حتى تخرج إليهم لكان خير لهم. That even when he would go home, sometimes they'd be like, يا محمد, يا رسول الله, we need to talk to you from outside of his house. That the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would actually oblige. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, He says, don't, don't, don't be upset, don't be offended by them, they don't know any better. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if they would wait until the messenger came out to them, on, of his own accord, on his own time, that would be better for them. لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to tell the sahaba radiallahu anhu, that when you go into the house of the messenger, don't enter in unless you've been invited. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا دُعِيتُمْ Go in when you've been invited, once you have permission from the Prophet to enter. And when you have been invited in, وَلَكِنِ إِذَا دُعَيْتُمْ When you have been invited in, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet then commands the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم that فَإِذَا طَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشِرُوا وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثِ That once you have eaten, when you have been invited into the home of the Prophet you have permission to enter, and when you've taken care of business, when you've eaten your food, you've eaten your food, then فَانْتَشِرُوا وَلَا مُسْتَعْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثِ Then get going on your way and don't just sit around and hang out and continue to chill out. Like he's not gonna kick you out. إِنَّ ذَلِكُمْ كَانَ يُؤْذِ النَّبِي You were actually causing him quite a bit of discomfort. فَيَسْتَحِي مِنْكُمْ But he was too shy to say anything to you. Because he's too kind, too generous, too merciful, too compassionate. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَسْتَحِي مِنَ الْحَقِ But Allah's calling you out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not shy away from the truth. Allah will let you know how it is. So the, this is the attitude of the Messenger ﷺ. But nevertheless, getting back on point. So he says, would you like to see the Prophet ﷺ while revelation is coming down on him? So he says, of course. So he lifts up the cloth from one side of the face of the Prophet ﷺ. وَهُوَ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ بِالْجِعْرَانَ That they were at a place called Ji'rana, that is a little bit outside of Mecca, on the way to Ta'if. So they were at a place called Ji'rana, which is outside of Mecca, on the way to Ta'if, on the road to Ta'if. And they were camped over there. فَإِذَا هُوَ مُحْمَرُ الْوَجْهِ And his face was completely red. وَهُوَ يَغِطُّ كَمَا يَغِطُّ الْبَكْرِ And he was basically lowering his, lowering his head and covering up his head, as if like, like somebody who was very shy, like a young shy person would basically lower their head and cover up their head. He was doing that basically to be able to have some privacy and to be able to deal with this experience of what was going on. In the Sahihain, again, it's mentioned from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, لَمَّا نَزَلَ الْحِجَابِ 
that when the ayat of hijab came down, وَإِنَّ سَوْدَى خَرَجَتْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ إِلَى مَنَاصِعَ لَيْلًا And Sauda bint Zama'a, the wife, Ummul Mu'mineen, Sauda radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu the mother of the believers, Sauda radiallahu anha, she had gone out to basically relieve herself of her needs, and she went out a little bit late at night. فَقَالَ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ عَنْهُ قَدَ عَرِفْنَاكِ يَا سَوْدَى And Umar radiallahu anhu, you know, these ayat of hijab had come down, and Umar radiallahu anhu was looking out for the better interest of the family of the Prophet sallallahu And so Umar, because at that point in time, there was a little bit of concern and worry from some of the munafiqoon, or some of the other non-Muslim tribes that lived in and around Medina, that they would basically try to come and harass. And in fact, there are established reports of them harassing not just the women of the Sahaba, but even some of the family of the Prophet was harassed by some of these people. So Umar radiallahu anhu wanted to make sure that everybody understood what a serious issue this was. So Umar radiallahu anhu was outside and he saw Sauda radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers, going. So he said, Qada arafna ki ya Sauda. He says, we, we recognize you, ya Sauda. Like, we know who you are. Meaning saying like, if, if I can recognize you at night, somebody else will also recognize you at night. And I'm looking out for your best interest because you're Ummul Mu'mineen. Ummuna Sauda, you're, you're our mother Sauda. But if it was somebody of ill intent or somebody who was of bad intention, something very bad could happen right now. So he kind of called her out. فَرَجَعَتِ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم فَسَأَلَتْهُ So she goes back to the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and she asked him about this. وَهُوَ جَالِسٌ يَتَعَشَّى And the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was sitting having dinner. وَالْعَرْقُ فِي يَدِهِ And the Prophet ﷺ was basically holding a bone that had meat on it. He was holding a bone, a kind of like the shoulder bone of an animal, that had meat on it. He was holding it and he was eating it. <clears throat> فَأُوحَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down divine revelation, the ayat of hijab. وَالْعَرْقُ فِي يَدِهِ And that bone was still in his hand. ثُمَّ رَفَعَ رَأْسَهُ Then he raised his head up. فَقَالَ إِنَّهُ قَدْ أُ قَدْ أُذِنَ لَكُمْ أَن تَخْرُجْنَ لِحَاجَتِكُنَّ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you permission that you can go out for your needs. That the ayat of hijab don't require, because the ayat of hijab had said, وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرُّجَ الْجِعْوَ وَقَدْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ It said, وَقَدْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ And stay in your homes. So then when Sauda went out and Umar radiallahu anhu objected, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has given you permission to go out for your needs. وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى That don't go out like people used to go out in the times of ignorance. That this is talking about a specific scenario, a specific situation. So then Aisha radiallahu anha actually notes based on this, فَدَلَّ هَذَا عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنِ الْوَحْيُ يُغَيِّبُ عَنْهُ إِحْسَاسَهُ بِالْكُلِّيَةِ That this basically tells us that, what the scholars note from this is that this tells us that divine revelation didn't take away the physical or the awareness or the consciousness of the Prophet ﷺ. That he would not lose consciousness, he would not lose control of his body. Because he was sitting there having dinner and then he stopped when revelation came and he continued to hold his food in his hand. And when revelation finished, he was still holding his food in his hands and he was fine. It's not like he just completely physically lost body, lost control of his body and he fell down and the food spilled and none of that happened. So it goes to show you while it was a very difficult experience but it allowed the Prophet ﷺ to maintain control of himself. So that of course is again very very important to note. And there's yet another narration which is mentioned that كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَمِّي ذَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ الْوَحْيُ تَرَبَّدَ لِذَلِكَ جَسَدُهُ وَوَجْهُهُ وَأَمْسَكَ عَنْ أَصْحَابِهِ وَلَمْ يُكَلِّمْهُ أَحَدٌ مِّنْهُمْ And that when divine revelation would come, the body of the Prophet ﷺ and the face of the Prophet ﷺ would literally heat up. Like he would get red in the face and his body would become very hot. He would sweat because of the pressure. When you exert yourself, you sweat. وَأَمْسَكَ عَنْ أَصْحَابِهِ And he would basically kind of pull back from the people who were around him, meaning he would seize conversation. And he would not talk to anyone while revelation was coming down. So it was a moment of quiet you know, reflection in receiving the divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another narration yet even tells us that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kunna عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنزل عليه that the Sahaba say we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the divine revelation was coming down on him وكان إذا أنزل عليه دام بصره مفتوحة عيناه that his eyes would remain open. 
His eyes would remain open. وَفَرَّغَ سَمْعَهُ وَقَلْبَهُ لِمَا يَأْتِيهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ But his hearing and his heart would become devoted to what was coming down. Meaning if you spoke to him at that time, he would not respond to you. He was completely immersed in listening to and internalizing what was coming down, but his eyes would remain open. Meaning it wasn't some, like the Prophet was having a seizure or anything like that. That all, any, anything of that nature is not correct. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he mentions a narration from Asma bint Yazid. She says that I was holding the string of Asba. Asba was one of the camels, the she camels of the Prophet The name of the camel was Asba. So she says, I was holding the string of the she camel, the Asba of the Prophet And the Prophet was riding the camel. When نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ الْمَائِدَةَ كُلَّهَا كُلُّهَا That the Surah Al-Ma'idah in its entirety came down on the Prophet ﷺ. وَكَادَتْ مِنْ ثِقْلِهَا تَدُقُوا عَدُودَ النَّاقَةَ And that because it was so heavy that literally it weighed down the camel. And there are multiple narrations of this, of this effect where it talks about فَلَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ أَنْ تَحْمِلَهُ فَنَزَلَ عَنْهَا That the camel was no longer able to carry the Prophet ﷺ so the Prophet ﷺ actually removed himself from the camel. Out of mercy upon the animal, because he didn't want the animal to feel that pressure. <clears throat> and, and we of course know in the Sahihain, in the Asbabun Nuzul of Surah Al-Fatih, that when the Prophet of Allah was returning back from Sulh Hudaybiyah, when he was returning back from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, that the Prophet ﷺ received divine revelation while riding on his camel, riding on the animal. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ would receive revelation in all these instances, and in all these cases. But the primary point I wanted to make here was, what an experience it was. And yes, it was beautiful, and it was fulfilling, and it was wonderful. And it most definitely was something that was a blessing for us. Because we benefited from it. But we have to understand that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ literally served as a filter. And he bore the weight of divine revelation so that we can enjoy it one day. And that's definitely a blessing um, in the form of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's just another reason why we should grow in love and why we should have such a deep profound appreciation for who Muhammad Rasulullah, peace and blessings be upon him was. The <clears throat> last thing I'd like to mention here about divine revelation, and this is very well known, is how did the Prophet ﷺ initially even deal with revelation? Because he understood how profound, how important, and how blessed uh, of uh, how blessed, you know, uh, what a great blessing it was. That the Prophet ﷺ, the narration is very well known, um, and it's mentioned in the Sabab al-Nuzul of Surah Al-Qiyamah. It's mentioned as the Sabab al-Nuzul of Surah Al-Qiyamah, Surah number seventy-five. That when the Prophet of Allah ﷺ would receive divine revelation. وَكَانَ هَذَا فِي الْإِبْتِدَاءِ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ مِنْ شِدَّةِ حِرْصِهِ عَلَىٰ أَخْذِهِ مِنَ الْمَلِكِ مِنَ ال... من الملك ما يوحى إليه عن الله عز وجل ليساوقه في التلاوة فأمر الله فأمره الله تعالى أن ينص أن ينصت لذلك حتى يفرغ من الوحي وتكفل له أن يجمعه في صدره وأن ييسر عليه تلاوته وتبليغه وأن يبينه له ويفسره ويوضحه ويوافقه على المراد منه. That initially in the beginning when divine revelation would come down to the Prophet ﷺ, he was seen moving his lips very rapidly. Because as Jibreel السلام, is reciting the Qur'an to him, the Prophet ﷺ, as Jibreel is reading to him, the Prophet ﷺ is, He's reading it back. As Jibreel is reading to him, he's reading it to himself, trying to repeat it very quickly so that he doesn't forget it. Because again, that was why, not because the Prophet ﷺ was weak in memory or the Prophet ﷺ didn't trust himself, but the Prophet ﷺ understood the weight of his responsibility. He understood the, mag the, the magnitude of the trust that was being given to him, what he was being entrusted with, the importance of it. And the Prophet ﷺ did not want to come up short in that trust, in that responsibility, in the fulfillment of that trust. So the Prophet ﷺ would rapidly try, start to try to repeat it back as Jibreel was reading it to him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually told the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Al-Qiyamah, Surah number 75, starting at ayah number 16, Allah told him, لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ That do not move your tongue rapidly with, it, with the Qur'an, with the revelation, لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ so that you can quickly grab it. So you can quickly preserve it. Don't do that. 
Why? Ayah number 17, Inna alayna jama'ahu wa qur'anahu. Because it is most definitely upon us. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is taqdeem wa ta'akhir. There is taqdeem wa ta'akhir. There is reversal of normal grammatical structure. There's abnormal sentence structure. What that basically achieves is it creates a meaning of exclusivity. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is solely our responsibility to compile it. I mean, don't move your tongue rapidly when it's being given to you to grab onto it. Why? It is solely upon us, Allah says. It is solely our responsibility to compile it, to gather it together. وَقُرْآنَهُ And to have the ability to read it back, that's our job, that's our responsibility. Meaning Allah is guaranteeing, Allah is taking the responsibility that you will know it when it's done, you will not forget it when it's done, and you will be able to read it back once it's completed. Not only that, فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعَ قُرْآنًا But Allah is giving the Prophet ﷺ some instruction that once we have read it to you, we have given it to you, فَاتَّبِعَ قُرْآنًا Then follow back, follow up with it. Then you read it to someone else. Then you go and read it to someone else. ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانًا Then not only that, but after you've read it to someone else, and it's been transcribed, and it's been written down, and it's been passed on to someone, after all of that, it is once again solely our responsibility, no doubt, without a shred of a doubt, guaranteed, that إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانًا That we will give the explanation of it, is again our responsibility. That the meaning of it, the understanding of it, we will give to you. And we, we will grant you and we will give you the ability to be able to explain it in its proper depth. The tafsir, the tawdih, the tashrih of it is our responsibility. We'll take care of it. The explanation is upon us. And so this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteeing to the Prophet you got it. And that's why the Prophet had instant memorization. The Prophet by virtue of this was the first hafiz of the Qur'an. Because as soon as he received it, it was preserved. He had it, it was done. And then once it was all done, that whole interaction of divine revelation was done, then he would have, it was so, you know, for, for anyone who knows half the terminology, then it was so pakka, all right, it was so well preserved in his memory, that he had the ability to be able to read it back to someone else. And that's where the kutab al-wahi, that's where the scribes of revelation, those who were given the responsibility to write the Qur'an, they would be called upon and then the Prophet ﷺ would read it to them and they would note it down, they would write it down. And they would begin working on memorizing it. And not only that, but then the Prophet ﷺ would open the meaning of it and the understanding of it upon the people, upon the ummah, Again, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would open the depth and the truth and the realization and the lessons and the wisdom of His kalam, of His divine speech to the humanity and to, to, to the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ was able to share that with the rest of humanity. So this is the entire experience, this is the entire process of divine revelation. And the scholars actually say something very beautiful here. The scholars actually say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet ﷺ, ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَا This was basically the... This is connected to where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ, وَلَا تَعْجَلْ بِالْقُرْآنِ there, This corresponds This corresponds to another place in the Qur'an Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah, in surah Taha In Surah number 20 Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ وَلَا تَعْجَلْ بِالْقُرْآنِ Don't rush with the Qur'an مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يُقَضَى إِلَيْكَ وَحْيُ Until the revelation has been completed upon you That the revelation has been sent down completely to you وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا Rather, what do you need to do? And say at that point in time. So be patient with the revelation. Don't rush to revelation. Let it complete and let it reach you completely. And once the revelation has been completed, then at that point in time, say, Rabbi zidni ilma. My Lord, my Master, the one who created me, provides for me, sustains me, protects me, guides me, the one who has granted me this blessing, zidni, increase me ilman. Increase me through this knowledge That allow me to understand this Allow me to implement this Allow me to become a better person And a better human being And more near and dear and closer to you And more pleasing to you By means of this knowledge that you have granted me 
That this directly correlates and corresponds to that revelation that we talked about earlier. And so this is a little bit of you know, detail in regards to revelation. What was the nature of revelation? How was revelation protected? And what was the interaction of the Prophet ﷺ with this divine revelation? Inshallah, from here on out when we continue, the focus will actually shift to talking about now the actual da'wah, the preaching of the message, the spreading of the message of the Prophet ﷺ, and those people who initially received that message, and how they received that message, and what were some of their initial experiences of receiving that message, and how the Prophet ﷺ embarked upon establishing not only spreading of this message and teaching of this message, but establishing the first semblances of a community and an ummah. Um, on the face of this earth. So that's inshallah where we will continue to from here on out. Um, for the brothers and sisters who attend uh, uh, the weekly session here, um, and also those who might be um, also listening or viewing online, um, inshallah this, uh, this session is the final seerah session till inshallah after the month of Ramadan. Um, simply because of, uh, even though there's quite a bit of time left till Ramadan, so everyone's probably trying to figure out what calendar I'm following. But uh, the, the reason for that is that um, for the next, uh, basically for the next couple of weeks, I'm actually going to be traveling. I'm, I'm traveling with my family, so I'll be out of town. I won't be in town to be able to conduct the sessions. And then after that, for the next four to five weeks, I'm actually teaching a um, a summer intensive in which we have um, we have class every single night. We have tafsir class every night, so I won't be able to come out here and continue with the sira sessions because I'll be uh, teaching at uh, teaching tafsir at the summer session. Uh, and then as soon as the summer program ends, pretty much the month of Ramadan begins uh, the following week. Uh, so then it will be the month of Ramadan and you'll have plenty more to do. You won't have to worry about this session, inshallah. And so we'll look forward to uh, continuing the session uh, post-Ramadan, after the month of Ramadan, inshallah. And my, my, my full intention and my best effort will be, you know, barring any other circumstances. Uh, but my full intention is to basically begin in the first week immediately following the end of the month of Ramadan bi ta'ala um, alhamdulillah we started uh, these sessions actually immediately following the previous Ramadan that's when we actually started setting the seerah I believe we've had uh, 30 some odd sessions so far alhamdulillah it's been a real blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for even for 30 sessions which basically is about 30 plus hours to be able to sit invest time into learning about the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be able to learn about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and learn something so valuable from our history is a real blessing from Allah we've all been had the opportunity to learn about the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hopefully um, develop more love for the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, and inshallah even come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by implementing the beautiful example of the Prophet sallallahu within our lives. It's a huge blessing of Allah and we hope to be able to continue that, that blessing. So my every intention is to inshallah continue with the seerah dars. Um, for those brothers and sisters who would like to maybe follow up, maybe you weren't able to attend all the sessions, you weren't able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, attend all the seerah, or maybe you'd like to go back and follow up. These sessions are recorded every single week and they are put on the uh, Qalam podcast, qalaminstitute.org. So you can access them there, inshallah. And they're free, they're available. So feel free to access them, share them, and um, utilize them for, inshallah, anyone and everyone's benefit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to implement the character and the lifestyle of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa taala make this a means of us close, coming closer to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us true love for Allah and His Messenger. Peace and blessings be upon Him. Which is Akmal Akhir and Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, for the local community, I, I, I guess uh, I'll announce this now. Starting on June the 9th, which will be a Saturday, uh, a few Saturdays away on June the 9th. Um, I will be teaching the summer intensive that we hold every single year um, here in Dallas at the Carrollton Masjid. A part of that summer intensive is that every evening we have Tafsir al-Qur'an sessions. And this year, last year we had the sessions as well, every single night. 
for about 28, 29 nights in a row. We have tafsir al-Qur'an every night from Salat al-Maghrib to Salat al-Isha. Last year we did the tafsir of Surah Maryam. Alhamdulillah, many people were able to benefit. Um, and so inshallah, this year we'll be doing the tafsir of Surah Taha, Surah number 20. And those sessions will be going on every night. Those sessions are for the students who come from all over the country, even from some other countries who come to attend our summer intensive. But those sessions are also open to the local community. We, we keep those open for the local community, so those will be available at the Carrollton Masjid from Maghrib to Isha every single night. So we encourage everyone to inshallah come through, it's a good way, it's a good uh, means of inshallah benefiting yourselves uh, during the summertime, especially for families, you know, people maybe with children and youth, it's a great inshallah investment of time to be able to learn about the Book of Allah. So I encourage everyone to come through and join us every single night at the Carrollton Masjid starting Saturday, June the 9th. بإذن الله تعالى جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله